that you thank him. You thank him for all he is and all he does. We have so much to be thankful for. I lost a good friend this week. And I don't understand it. But sometimes in my heart, that's where the greatest worship takes place. To thank God. To have friends. That when I do lose them, that there is a void. Because that void means that I have love. So at this time, just thank God for all he's done for us. And all he's going to do. thing I want us to think about is supplication. The scripture says that he will supply all of our needs according to the riches and glory. Unfortunately, it's not always all of our needs according to what we want. So there in lies where our heart needs to be according to his riches and glory. I ask at this time that you ask God to open your heart and to turn it to him and let him supply your needs and let him supply the needs according to the riches and glory. It might not be exactly what you had in mind, but what we want is what he's got in mind. Save us for our sins. It's that grace, that grace that's amazing. change 
to you this morning with open hearts. Lord, speak to us. We're lost. We're lost without you, Lord. Lord, I ask that you help us to be the light to the world right now. I pray for this church and I pray for this community. that people can see Jesus through us. Lord, your grace is amazing and help us to shine that light to the world so they can see that grace through us, Lord. Lord, help our hearts to be a, a tilled soil ready to receive the word that you have today. Help it to bloom in our hearts.
Amen. Let's pray for the kids as they get ready to go to Children's Church. Father, we pray that you would be with our children, that your grace, Lord Jesus, would be with them as they are taught and discipled, Lord Jesus, and that, um, Lord, that you would be near them. Father, that as the end of, at the end of the month, we're going to, in family worship service, we're going to talk about children of the promise, Lord Jesus. We pray that all of our children would receive the promise of the fullness of the, the Holy Spirit in their lives, Father God. Be near to them, Lord Jesus. Prepare their hearts for that grace to enter in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, you can head out to Children's Church this morning, and they'll be back in in a little bit for communion. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. At the end of the month, we'll have... uh, we're going to reinstate BGMC again, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge. And the way that we're going to do that as best we can, we'll have the kids come up here uh, and they'll have their money containers and things like that. And then the adults can come forward and, you know, put money into their, their coin containers. That way we don't have a mixture of people going and coming and things like that. It can just be, you know, few at a time can come up and, and we can make that all possible. We'll get Buddy Bear allowed and have the, the penny war or the coin war again. It'll be a lot of fun. So I mean, we were trying to think creatively about how we can do that safely, and, and there were, that was our best solution. So um, would you open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4 will be in verses 13 through 21. 1 John chapter 4, 13 through 21. I expect that this is pretty universal for the most part, that all of us have moments in time where there is just just real, surreal presence of God in our lives. And we can just kind of step back from those moments and realize the power of God's love made complete in us. Uh, For me, this happened not long ago. Uh, we were outside at our house. It was, I think it was late fall last year. It was October, and uh, the, the weather was amazing. You know, the Kentucky October, mid-October weather, it was phenomenal. The leaves were changing on the trees, and um, it was just beautiful. We were outside. I was working on my truck in the field, and um, Wilson, uh, my youngest son, he was, you know, a little over a year at the time, he crawls up on the... Uh, the wheel, you know, up onto the engine bay, and he's looking there. I, I, we got a picture here this morning. I'm going to show you uh, if you could check that picture out. That was, I actually stopped, and I'm like, I've got to take a picture of this. That's the feeling that, I, I mean, that's how real it was. That I just felt the love and the presence of God. And I was, you know, it's one of the moments where you look out there, and you're like, I own that tree right there, you know what I mean? I only had one tree in my entire yard when we lived in a subdivision, but now I've got like several trees, more trees than I can know what to do with. Or, uh, if you'd like to cut some down, you can come out and help me anytime. But anyways, in this next picture, that's, I was working on the car in, the, in this next picture, and there's Wilson, crawls up, he's got his little nook in his mouth, and, he, and it's just one of those moments where you just realize how God has blessed you and the fullness of God's love. It's just all of a sudden you realize the completeness of it, and I could feel the tangible love of God, and I was thanking him, so much so that I stopped and I took a picture of it so that I would remember the feelings that I had at that moment. And I have to ask this question, talking about complete love. By the way, those are hands together making a heart, if you couldn't see that, but that's what that is. Anyway, um, what if we took the time to stop and notice the love of God and how it truly envelops us in our lives more often. Um, C.S. Lewis may have said this best, to be honest with you. He says, I know the sun is real, not because I can see it clearly. Believe me, if you try to focus on the sun clearly uh, with the naked eye, you're going to do damage to yourself, right? And so uh, he says, I know that it's there. I know that I can... No, the sun is real, not because I can focus on it clearly, but because by it I can see everything else. 
And so my proposal to you today is, is that in this understanding of love of God and then dispensing it to other people around us, that I can understand all things together in this life. And I can see and experience the completeness of love. Dr. Rutland, uh, who's a great preacher and uh, former uh, seminary uh, pro- uh, president, he said, the greatest revival on the face of this planet will happen not because of human need. I mean, if there's any time that revival could happen because of human need, you would think this would be it right now. He said, revival will happen in the world not because of human need, but because of when people begin to understand who God really is. So when we can get the identity of God correct, then everything changes in our hearts and it sets us on fire. Let's read 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 to 21. It says this. This is how that we know we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior to the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they are in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. My favorite metaphor for this, as well as John 17, which it much mirrors John 17, is the German nesting dolls or Russian nesting. I don't know what country it's from, but anyway, you know the little dolls that go inside of each other, all complete in one. And he says this. This is my favorite part. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Isn't that a fascinating phrase? In this world, we are like Jesus. There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and their sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have seen, not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother or sister. Recently, in the lives of my two oldest sons, I've told them that there is a phrase that they will get sick of hearing over and over again. The phrase that I'm going to say with, to them over and over again and have said to them over and over again is the phrase, follow through. It's not good enough for you to work on your four-wheelers, but you got to put the tools away. It's not good enough that you just go halfway or it's not, it's not following through to brush your teeth and not put the cap on the toothpaste. It's not good enough that you you know, ride your four-wheelers or you do something out on the farm and you don't put away your things in the barn. We can learn something from this. It's not just enough to experience the love of God in your life and not share that love with somebody else. It's not what the essence of Christian life and the love of God is about if we don't complete the event of love itself by following through with the event and letting other people around us experience God's love through us. So John is talking about this mutual indwelling idea. Picture those Russian nesting dolls. The believer in God, God in the believer. The completion of this love event is experiencing the love of God and then allowing others to experience because love that is from God permeates our lives to the point that you cannot help but show the love of God all around you. I think that is the authentic experience of love is when God's love comes into your heart that it emanates from you and you can't even help it. And so you begin to love everybody in your sphere of fluence around you. My favorite phrase, like I said, in all of this passage is, is in this world, we're like Jesus. That's all I ever really wanted in life. I, I don't even know that I really wanted to be a pastor all that much or preach all that much as much as I just want to be like Jesus. In my life, in my context, in my time, I want to vocationally live what it means to be like Jesus in the world. And uh, 
here's the scripture that says I can do it. And I'm empowered to do it by the Holy Spirit. And this is how we're like Jesus in the world. Jesus experienced the love of the Father and became the revelation of the Father's love to the world. In this world, we're like Jesus means that becoming the revelation of the Father's love to the world also. And so John seems to be implying that the relationship of believers to God in the world should reflect the relationship that they have of Jesus to God. As Jesus is in the Father's love, so we are in the Father's love and in the world, and we obediently make God's love known to the world. I love the way the Danish philosopher and theologian Soren Kierkegaard made it, said it. He said, Christ never asked for admirers. You have, to, you have to really grasp what he's saying here. Christ never asked for admirers. When Jesus uses the expression follower, he always explains it in such a way that one perceives imitation or being imitators. Imitating Jesus is not adhering to a set of teachings, but imitation is and imitating a life lived well. So if you're going to be like Jesus, formed into the image of Jesus, then you have to imitate Jesus in his way. Follow him in his way. I mean, there's so many beauties of that phrase, following. One, it means that you don't have to lead. You don't have to decide everywhere you're going to go because you can just simply follow Jesus. It also gives us the indications of following Jesus is that we may not know where we're going. We're just following. We're watching for the footsteps of Jesus Christ and we're following them as close as we possibly can. Doesn't that sort of give you a little bit of relief in your life? Lord, I don't know exactly where I'm going, but I'm following you the best of my ability. And as long as we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, it doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. It's not enough that you speculate about Jesus' love or even experience it individually. You must complete this process of imitating Jesus and his love and taking the love of God you have experienced and showing it to others. Now, when I think about this, it, I mean, it's sort of uh, how this I process that in this world we are like Jesus and how the completion of love happens. Imagine for a moment that Jesus comes to earth, that he experiences the love of God, the, all that God has to offer. He's like us in physical flesh and form, and then he experiences the power of the love of God throughout his young years, his childhood, all that that happens, and then all of a sudden Jesus keeps it selfishly all to himself. Imagine what it would be like if Jesus said, no, I'm going to keep all the love of God that I've experienced in my life to me and to me only. I mean, it, it, it would be like the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. You know, that's the gospel narrative, right? O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth. That's it. It's just dark. <laughs> Jesus comes experiences the fullness of the love of God, there's darkness in the world, and that's it. You just cut it off. It would be Luke chapter 1 in part, and then you just shut the whole thing down. No everlasting life, no hopes and fears met in thee tonight, no praises to the king, no wondrous gifts or blessings from heaven. And we too, if we selfishly experience the love of God in our lives and don't begin to take that love and express it to the world who doesn't know the love of God, then we have simply taken the gospel and cut it off at chapter 1 and are not allowing the love of God to come to the whole world. And so there's these real factors that we have to deal with. I mean, this is the nitty-gritty of Christian life. This is true discipleship, but we're going to put it in those terms. There's real factors that we have to deal with. You cannot fully understand the love of God and not forgive people. Have you ever noticed that Jesus usually couples things together? Forgive and you'll be forgiven. The Lord's Prayer, the most elemental side of this whole idea. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debted against us. As... I mean, at the same time, 
I can't hang on to unforgiveness and receive forgiveness at the same time. I've got to empty my hands of my unforgiveness so that God can allow his forgiveness to come into my heart. I mean, that's a detail of Christian life that some people just don't like to talk about. But it's true. You cannot fully understand God's love and hold grudges or hate your brother or sister or person that stole your business or your money or whatever else and know the fullness or the completion of God's love in your life. You cannot have fully understood the love of God and be a racist or hate someone that has hurt you or may be currently hurting you. Now, I'm not nominalizing abuse or all the things that happen in life, but the truth of the matter is, is, is that we are missing this key component of love completed in our lives if we hate another person, their race, their ethnicity, their gender, or anything else. Um, let me try to put this in uh, terms without uh, trying to be sensitive to all those who may have experienced uh, some type of racism or prejudice in their lives. Um, I've told you that we have eight goats uh, on our little farm in Lawrenceburg, and we have two baby Jersey calves um, who are doing very well, thank God. If you prayed for my cows, I appreciate that. They're doing good. Thank you, Jesus. Barring whatever happens this afternoon, they're still doing good, right? Um, but the guy that I bought these eight goats from told me, he's like, listen, man, those goats are racist. <laughs> And I, I remember, like, glazing over that statement. I keep thinking, what in the world is this guy talking about? Those goats are racist. That's what he said. I have a mixture of boar goats and Nubian goats. And uh, I, I just thought, you know, goats are goats, man. I don't think they have the cognitive skills to hate each other. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a novice farmer, okay? I experience goat racism, okay, on the farm. And it's crazy. And man, it's such a weird thing. But the boar goats, or the mostly boar goats, really don't necessarily like the Nubian goats. I don't know why. Don't understand it. The cows sort of hate the goats, and the goats hate the cows. You know what I mean? Like, they just don't really seem to get along. And then I have this little Nubian billy goat, and he, like, goes off and holds hands with the other Nubian doe. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just a weird scenario. Why do they get along and then other ones don't get along? I, it's very hard to understand to a certain degree. And I kind of stand there as the farmer or whatever you want to say. You know, I love all the animals. I, I want to... I want them all to get along. I want, I want them to uh, experience what my love is for the animals and, and that they grow and that they get better. And, and, you know, despite all of their differences. And I believe that we begin to see the fullness of God's love and it becomes complete in us as we learn to love others despite the differences that we experience in life. And then the world begins to see the fullness of God's love. I mean, what I want to say to those goats, if they would understand me, and I probably said it before to them, if you love me, you'll love each other. Stop butting heads all the time. You know, the metaphor Jesus uses of sheep and goats is really not abnormal for human life, right? You are more like a goat. I, maybe I shouldn't say that. Anyway, <laughs> we are more like sometimes animals than we are human sometimes. And we're ignorant. And we're always trying to butt heads with another and steal food from each other. Man, goats, they're so mean. <laughs> they want all the food for themselves. And when you're wrestling a 200-pound goat trying to get food to the little goats, you know, it's not. Farming is interesting. Jesus said a lot when he said we're sheep of his pasture, <laughs> okay? Uh, but Jesus says it explicitly in John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, the truth of complete love is, is that we learn by living like Jesus 
what it means to love one another, not just to tolerate each other, but to really passionately love one another even in our sin, even in our shortcomings, in our ignorance, in our uh, frailty of human life. That the power and the love of God is this, that despite me, Jesus loves me. And if I am able to see the completeness of God's love in me, then God can allow his love to so permeate my life that I love you despite your shortcomings too. And the mark of the Christian community is that we love one another. That's true discipleship. That's true grace of God's love complete in our lives. And by no means do I say it's easy. <laughs> by no means. There are times, I said it this morning during discipleship class, I just wish people would read their Bible. <laughs> just read your Bible, folks. Come on. Statistics tell us that less than 20% of you have read your Bible at any given time this week. Pick up your Bible and read it. But I still love you. <laughs> I still love you. Pray. Pray. Jesus wants to talk to you. <laughs> Even if you're going to just give him your laundry list of items that you had this week that you were frustrated about, talk to him. He loves you. He wants to hear from you. Those are my frustrations. I still love you. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to say anything, because that's not true love either, is it? True love speaks. True love confronts. Look at Jesus' ministry. It was all confrontation, 100% of it. I did a matrix on it in an Excel document. It's all confrontation, folks. <laughs> he was in odds with people and the enemy all day long. And you wonder why your life is like it is. Jesus' life was just like it. Let's look deeply at his life. Amen. To have complete love, there must be an object of that love and then an outflow of that love. Have you ever heard the illustration used about the Dead Sea? You know the, why the Dead Sea is dead? Not just because of its elevation, but also because it doesn't go anywhere. The river comes down from the mountains of the Jordan and then runs out and it stops in the Dead Sea and there is no movement from there. It just stays. It's sit. It's stagnant. That's why the Dead Sea in Israel is dead because it has no outflow. You wonder why your life doesn't have completion, why your life doesn't feel fulfilled? Maybe it's because you're not allowing the love of God to flow out of you. And him to renew in you. Ryan, you can come. Let me finish by saying this. And then we'll pick up again next week. Because of this mutuality of the relationship John is talking about. The, the Russian nesting doll idea. We're in the Father. The Father is in us. Christ is in us. We're in Christ. The Holy Spirit's in all of us. And he permeates our lives. It also implies that the measure that you have experienced God's love will be directly proportional to the measure you are able to show God's love to the world. So however I've experienced God's love will be my only capacity to show the God's love to the world. So in thinking about this, if that is truly right, if that's correct, then my prayer for us as a Christian community is, is that we would experience a greater fullness of the love of God. In the greater measure that you've experienced God's love, I am confident of this, that you will explosively begin to share it to everybody around you. Because something that's so good, you can't just help but share. I mean, I've talked to people that visited the local Outback Steakhouse, you know, or, or whatever, Cattleman Steakhouse. And they'll talk for 25 minutes about how good the steak that they just had was. If it's really that good, you're going to tell somebody about it. It's Amway. It's viral marketing. That's what it is. And if you've truly experienced the forgiveness and the freedom that we just sang about, the love of God, 
in your life, then you're going to tell somebody about it. You're going to share. It's going to emanate from you to a large degree. So years ago, there was a fairly well-known preacher that was doing some sermon stealing. Now, he wasn't just downloading sermons and re-preaching them or something like that or taking them out of a book or whatever. This guy was literally taking illustrations with spiritual content from other preachers and he was adapting them and putting himself into the story in the first person even though he hadn't experienced that story. It's, <laughs> it's a lie. You know, it's, it's defiant. And so when he got found out about this, that he was taking these stories, adapting them to himself and sharing them like he experienced them, I mean, the culture in his church just ate him for breakfast because it was so inauthentic. It was, I mean, it was just a straight up lie. And uh, it'd be one thing if you just told the story as it happened in somebody else's life. It's a whole different thing if you start saying, well, this happened to me lot of ethical issues there in sermon preaching so when he was found out naturally his culture ate him from for breakfast and the inauthenticity came back on him big time but the truth of the matter is this that you cannot give what you have not experienced it's an empty shell of a narrative if you haven't truly experienced what you're giving away So this afternoon, we're going to give out groceries and the love of Jesus in prayer. But if you don't love the people, maybe you shouldn't give out the groceries. I mean, if you don't really have a heart for the people that have a need, why would you do something like that? You cannot give what you have not experienced in your life. If you haven't experienced the profound power of God's love in your life, you're not going to be able to show the power of God's love to other people. And my worry of our contemporary culture is just like what that preacher was doing by taking stories and sharing them around that were not his own. My worry is, is that the church, because we know it should be done, is just handing out shells of God's narrative of love when we truly haven't experienced it at all in our own lives. And the problem with that is this, that the world can see inauthentic love 10 times faster than they can see true love. Let me say it like this. C.S. Lewis in his final book of the Narnia series is called The Last Battle. It is absolutely enrapturing to read this book. What happens is this, in a nutshell. An ape finds the mane of a lion, the skin of a lion, and he has this donkey friend that he basically manipulates to do everything that he wants to. And he takes and he fashions that mane of a lion and puts it on this donkey. And then he begins parading the donkey around that he's actually Aslan the great lion of Narnia, the creator of Narnia. And then he begins to manipulate people to do all of his things. But the problem that begins to happen is this, is, is that the good forces of Narnia steal the donkey away with the fake lion skin on it. And they think, oh, here, all we have to do is tell people, you weren't seeing the true Aslan. This is what you were seeing. It was a fake Aslan. It wasn't him. But what they didn't anticipate was this, is, is that the fake Aslan's presence would deceive more people into realizing the authenticity of the true Aslan. And this is exactly Satan's plan. You wonder how Satan does it and how he deceives people. It's because there is the possibility of a fake God out there of an empty shell of a God and the world recognizes false love faster than it will ever recognize true love in the love of God that's what we're up against folks but it is overcomable if you've read the end of the last battle God's love 
always triumphs. We know that. So the measure that you have experienced God's love will be directly proportional to the measure that you are able to show God's love to the world. I want to pray for you this morning for this reason. That God would begin to reveal the fullness, the completion of His powerful love to you right now. I want you to have one of those surreal moments like the pictures that I took earlier where you experience the fullness of God's powerful love in your life so that you can begin to show it to the world. A love that transcends all of your problems, all of your hardships, all of your frustrations. A love that becomes so real that you can't help but show it to the world. So let me pray for you this morning. If somebody would also go out and uh, bring the kids back in for communion. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today requesting of you that you would come in your mighty power. You have saved us, set us free, Lord, redeemed us by the power of your love. And Lord, I ask that the fullness of that love would come powerfully to us. And that we would experience, each one of us, the fullness of God's completion of love in our lives. So that in turn, we complete that love event so that the world can experience the true, authentic love of God to the world through us. Lord, I'm not exactly sure why you've chosen us fallen people to show the love of God to the world. But I know this, because you've chosen us, Lord Jesus, I asked that you would give us the fullness of that love so we can show the world. Father, experientially draw us into the fullness of the love of God so that we can show the world what it means to experience true love. And even though that there's an enemy out there who's parading around like the true God, even though there's a deceiver who walks in the earth with a hollow, empty love, Lord, let us somehow by the Spirit transcend all of that so that we can show them what true love really looks like. Give us creative ways and ideas that we can be true love to the world who doesn't know love. To our families, to our friends, to our children, to our aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters and parents. Be near, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The kids are coming back in now. And we're going to receive communion together. If you didn't receive um, your communion elements, the individually packaged ones, you can receive them. If you're at home right now, uh, you can enjoy this moment together with us. Grab a cracker or a wafer or a piece of bread or something. Hopefully you have that. If you have some grape juice at your house, you can do this too. But I'm sure you can substitute just about anything for the elements as we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll give you a few moments to unpackage your elements. Let me read for you in Luke 22, the first, first supper, the first communion that they took together. It says this, when the hour had come, Jesus and the apostles reclined at the table and they said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until the fine fulfillment of the kingdom of God. 
After taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, This is, and take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink of it again, the fruit of the vine, until it comes in the kingdom of God. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after the supper, he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So we've done just this. We've distributed the elements of Jesus' body and his blood. And now we're going to take it in remembrance of Jesus Christ. In remembrance of his sacrifice on the cross. He said, I do this before I suffer. That means his suffering was imminent on the cross. His blood was shed for you. That's the fullness of the love of God. His body was broken for you. So that you don't have to deal with your sins anymore. Your conscience can be completely clear today because of what Jesus did on the cross that we remember right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So let's take the bread. And if you would, just snap it between your fingers to remember the broken body of the Lord. Jesus, we take this element today in Jesus' name, remembering the suffering of the cross. And Lord, we pray that you once again cleanse us of our sins and bring us into the future. Lord Jesus, whole and healthy and full of the Spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the bread together. Take the cup. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this cup, that it's a reminder of your blood that was poured out on the hill called Calvary. And Lord, we pray that as we remember your sacrifice, Lord Jesus, that you would uh, bring us into the future, Lord Jesus, for a moment to experience what it will be like in part as we take the fruit of the vine together with you in the fullness of your kingdom in heaven as we go back and forth back to the cross here to present and into the future Lord be with us I pray come Lord Jesus come in Jesus name amen take the fruit of the vine together would you stand let's worship the Lord for a moment
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. wait on the Lord for a few moments. Thank you, Jesus. just feel in my spirit that somebody's got something to say. <laughs> it may not be, you know, in breaking of the Holy Spirit. It just may be something that needs to be said right now.
certainly think that moments like this all teach us something, you know. Life is short. I love the psalmist who said, teach us, Lord, to number our days so that we might live wisely. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's a sobering thought. Perhaps today, by way of memorial, maybe just do something, as small as it may be, to show the love of God to somebody else today. Life is short. Make hay while the sun shines. And if that's the case, maybe just something small. If you go through a drive through today, pay for the people behind you. Maybe buy somebody a coffee. Maybe give somebody that you know needs a $20 bill, you know, or something like that. Those are small, tangible things. Maybe somebody else needs to make a phone call this afternoon and forgive somebody that you've had odd against for some time. Maybe we need to express some things that we have found unexpressible in the past. Let's let the Spirit work through us in love. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I pray that you would bless us, that you would keep us, that you would turn your face towards us, that the light of the glory of your face would shine upon us, that you be gracious unto us, Lord Jesus, and give us your peace. Lord Jesus, let us show and understand and experience the fullness of your love so we can make it complete, Lord Jesus, by allowing that love to permeate our lives to the point where people experience it elsewhere. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remember from 3 to 5 today, we're going to try to do clothing if it doesn't rain this afternoon. So if you're able to help with clothing, we're going to put out some of it so people can uh, receive that. Uh, as well as, remember, Wednesday nights have transitioned from 7 to 8 on Wednesday to 9 to 10 uh, with Mark Mangan right now in discipleship. We'd love for you to be part of that. It's been a great thing already. Absolutely loved it. We hope to see you there. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.